From Here to the Stars, a video series created by the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. The TVIW is a nonprofit organization dedicated to thoroughly exploring the science and engineering that can eventually open up the reality of interstellar travel. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. Our guest today is Dr. Lewis Friedman. Lewis Friedman holds a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. He has worked on deep space missions at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and he co-founded the Planetary Society with Carl Sagan and Bruce Murray, serving as the organization's executive director for 30 years. He was co-leader of the Keck Institute for Space Studies Asteroid Retrieval Mission and Interstellar Medium Exploration Studies at Caltech. Here is Dr. Lewis Friedman. In 1980, you co-founded the Planetary Society with Carl Sagan and Bruce Murray, and then served as its executive director for 30 years. Tell me about the Planetary Society. Why was it created, and what was its goal? Well, Carl Sagan and Bruce Murray were struck by the enormous popularity which they lived with every day of, of planetary exploration. Uh, the Voyager mission uh, was on its way to the outer planets. It made cover of Time magazines. Uh, the Viking mission had landed on Mars, and people were intrigued with the search for life in the solar system. And yet the government was making decisions to uh, end planetary exploration, and I mean literally end it. And there was a total disconnect between the popularity and importance of these scientific uh, exploration and the uh, political uh, will. So what do you do in situations like that? You form a public interest group to advocate for planetary exploration. And that's what we did. We saw a citizen's role involved. Uh, I'm a missions person, as uh, my background at JPL indicates I wanted to work on planetary missions. I had worked on Mariner Venus Mercury and on Voyager and on Galileo and I was looking forward to doing uh, a great deal more but the missions for the 1980s were all canceled. There weren't going to be any and so we got together and we said uh, let's uh, let's see if there's a role for a private support not for conducting deep space missions as much as supporting the government's role in uh, in continuing planetary exploration. And we were very successful at that. We grew very rapidly as a public membership organization. We turned around some of these decisions. We we got planetary missions flying again. The, the Magellan mission was finally approved and then the Mars program was finally restored. What are some of the actions that were taken early in the planetary society's uh, days, the, uh, the efforts that were made? Well, I think one thing we that surprised all of us, uh, that is Bruce and Carl and I and the others who uh, uh, played leadership roles in the society, was the importance of our own projects and in, internal funding uh, to get things started. Uh, not that we were going to conduct a hundred million dollar or half billion dollar missions, but that even a hundred thousand dollar activities could seed further exploration. We, uh, when the government uh, got out of the SETI business, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, we were able to fund uh, uh, the, the continuation of the search with the development of innovative receivers and placed at Harvard University and were able to continue on the, uh, the SETI program. Um, we funded some early studies in in situ resource utilization uh, for uh, stimulating interest in Mars exploration. But as I look back on the Planetary Society, I think our two, two most influential and significant developments were basically getting the Mars program restored in the U.S. There wasn't any missions from, from Viking all the way to the mid-90s and getting rovers installed in the program. Uh, actually, the scientific community opposed rovers. They thought, uh, they thought it took up valuable payload weight that could be used for instruments. And we saw a great deal of interest in that. And so we teamed with uh, uh, the Soviets and then later the Russians who were actually developing Mars rovers. And it looked like uh, they would do such missions if, uh, if it uh, was going to continue over there. And uh, we brought a whole lot of attention to, uh, by conducting tests in both Russia and the United States. Uh, 
So that accomplished two purposes. One is it got a lot of interest in Mars exploration for the U.S. program, and the other is it brought the geopolitical power, just like the Apollo program had, to um, uh, seeing that planetary exploration was a worldwide enterprise and that there were lots of opportunities and, and lots of uh, things that it could be as an instrument of bringing people together to make greater accomplishments. You wrote a book entitled Human Spaceflight from Mars to the Stars. I thought it was available on Amazon. Apparently it's in uh, the taking pre-orders. But if you would, talk a little bit about that. Well, I got into solar sailing back in when I was at JPL in the uh, mid-70s uh, to do a mission that couldn't be done any other way. That is to rendezvous and fly in formation with Halley's Comet. And uh, But it was a very audacious mission. I mean, even now it would probably be impossible. It was a huge sail uh, and uh, it was a, for a heavy spacecraft and it was uh, as optimistic as we were that we could do it. It was still a project before its time. But the lure of solar sailing is almost anything you want to do in the solar system, you can do another way. But one thing solar sailing can do that you can't do any other way is it is the technology that can take us to the stars. And by that I mean it doesn't have to carry propellant. Now when you get away from the sun, you need to have an external light source, you have to have beamed energy, and so the sun as a light source would be replaced by a laser as a light source. But it, that is the only practical means, and this has been verified in various studies and conferences over the years, it's the only practical technology we have now that we could see our way to developing interstellar flight. And that's a very special lure, because as we're learning now, especially with uh, uh, the great discoveries about exoplanets, there's no habitable world between Mars and the stars. Mars may not even be habitable, but it's barely so. And so if we think about the idea of moving civilizations or, or moving life off of this planet, it's basically from Mars to the stars, you have no other destination. And so the notion of whether or not we can fly interstellar is still, is still a big open question. And um, so I got into that and I went to some conferences and I was disappointed because all of these conferences concentrated on technologies that I had been reading about since the 1940s. And I mean literally, the 1940s and 1950s. Fusion, spacecraft, matter-antimatter rockets, uh, uh, cryogenically cooling people for multi-generation spaceships, huge uh, kinds of uh, arcs that would be uh, flying in, in, in uh, space for, for hundreds and hundreds of centuries and millennia. And the whole notion of life support, even in our own realistic programs, hadn't changed much. The kind of suits the astronauts were wearing in the 1960s and 70s are about the same kind of suits they're wearing now. The capability for flying long duration missions is no longer now than it was in the days of Apollo. We're making progress. I'm very pleased with the NASA uh, Journey to Mars campaign. But it's still, even if I project it out a century, it's still going to be a few years of space flight and uh, missions that uh, will be limited compared to the dimensions of the stars. And I realized that there's a whole set of other technologies that weren't getting adequate study. And that's very small spacecraft with, with solar sails that could exit the solar system very fast. And that made the whole notion of our extending our human presence very different. We would extend our, our human presence not with our bodies out in space, but with the new technologies of microelectronics and nanotechnology and biomolecular engineering and advanced information processing and creations of virtual reality and virtual exploration. We would, we would interact perhaps with other planets with pre-programmed biomolecule payloads uh, on spacecraft and sending data back uh, over huge distances to create virtual worlds for us to explore here. So that was sort of my changing notion of uh, the future of extending human presence. But that led to the conundrum, which is, does that mean we're hidebound on Earth? Do we stay here only to be a single planet species with all the limitations of our eggs in one basket? And that is equally unsatisfying. And that 
of course, there Mars beckons because Mars is a world that if we can't make it there, we clearly aren't going to make it anywhere else. And it does have the stuff of, of life support. It does have atmosphere. It does have water. So just for the reasons of creating another uh, limitless goal for humanity of exploration, someday of settlement, Mars becomes not just the next destination beyond the moon, it becomes the only destination. We'll get to Mars, it'll take us thousands of years to do some things there, to settle it, to transform it, and by that point we'll be all over the universe with our uh, virtual exploration and robotic probes uh, ex extending the human presence in that way. And that's what the book is about. Before I forget, I want to congratulate you on having an asteroid named after you. If, uh, if you would, tell me a little bit about maybe your reaction or maybe what you were doing when you got the news. Well, it's very interesting. Um, you know, back, uh, you asked about the Planetary Society earlier in our early project. We started funding uh, several observers in the discovery of near-Earth objects before it was an approved program at NASA, before there was much even astronomy interest in them. In fact, they some of the astronomers put down the whole notion of looking at asteroids as the vermin of the sky. They're just in the way. They don't. They're, they're not interesting, and they're just tiny objects that clutter up the photos. <laughs> uh, of course, we've learned a lot about NEO since then from a lot of points of view. The scientific point of view of how uh, important they are to telling us about the origin and evolution of the solar system and the dynamics in the solar system, the, uh, the existential threat to Earth by being hit by uh, near-Earth objects as uh, uh, possibly a threat to uh, to the populations or even to civilization, uh, and then the future possibility of exploiting them and using them for resources in conducting ventures deeper into space. But back in the 80s, we uh, began helping astronomers who couldn't get funding otherwise. And um, one of them was a scientist by the name of Eleanor Helene, working at Caltech. And she had a program that was uh, doing a first-rate job of discovering near-Earth objects, not by today's standards with the big NASA funding that's going into it, but by very limited citizen funding and small grants that could uh, do it. And she very graciously... Uh, named the asteroid uh, for me and my wife. The official name is Lewis and Connie Friedman. And we were, you know, very honored. We got a plaque, we put it up in the office, and uh, uh, and we have a bit of us orbiting, orbiting somewhat eccentrically, I might say. Uh, but that's the way I feel I operate, too, out there in the solar system. Whether we, our descendants, ever get to visit it is not as important as knowing that uh, a little bit of us is... is uh, is being remembered out there in space. What are some of the ways that people can help the Planetary Society? And I'm thinking maybe people who are themselves not scientists. Well, Planetary Society is a citizens group. And so uh, you go to planetary.org, you can join the Planetary Society. Uh, they're conducting a mission now, which is light sail, mission I started. We had attempted to do a solar sail mission uh, first on a Russian rocket, which unfortunately ended up in the uh, Arctic Ocean, uh, so we never got to fly our spacecraft. And then we discovered uh, through NASA uh, another class of spacecraft, the nanosails. They also had a failed rocket, uh, this American rocket, uh, uh, the Falcon, uh, on its maiden flight, failed. And uh, so they were looking for to team with somebody, and we said we would do that. And as a result of that, we ended up building a somewhat more capable version of it, that is one with a communication system and an attitude control system. That became LightSail, and as you know, uh, LightSail had a successful um, test flight. Now, it didn't do its solar sail mission yet, but it had a, success a successful test flight of the uh, boom deployment, which we designed. It's a rather, it can be a modest sized sail. That's what's so nice about it. It was only five and a half by five and a half meters which is still pretty big. It's as big as any room that you'll be meeting in in the next few weeks. But uh, but compared to uh, what we had for uh, space, heavy spacecraft a generation ago, uh, this one could carry a, a five kilogram spacecraft and achieve good accelerations to be able to accomplish uh, a mission to increase the energy out of Earth orbit 
or to fly out in uh, interplanetary. They're now developing such things as uh, for interplanetary CubeSats. JPL has picked up on the technology uh, along with the NASA Marshall uh, Space Flight Center, and they're going to be doing uh, two missions uh, in a few years. One is a lunar flashlight, which will shine, uh, reflect light on the moon, and one will rendezvous with an asteroid. So uh, it led to this whole new class of spacecraft, which interests me so much for the future of interstellar travel, and that is very, very small spacecraft with sails that can build up big accelerations. Excellent, excellent. I really appreciate you taking the time for the interview. It was excellent stuff. Good, good. Well, I'm happy to do that, and I'm hoping that the kinds of discussions that come out of these meetings can lead to uh, more creative ideas that bring things like light sail and other, other good missions uh, into being. That was Dr. Lewis Friedman. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button, and you can subscribe to our channel for more such videos. I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. On behalf of all of us here at the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, I thank you.